Hello, we're going to wait just a few minutes as everyone and, and comes in. You can tell me the sound, is it, is it loud enough? It, yep. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, multitasking, eating while watching. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fritos. Mm. Give it just a two more minutes and I'm just going to mute everybody just so there's no background noise. few more here. All right, well, we can get started. I'll keep an eye on the waiting room. I'm sure there are more that will join us, but, um, and there will be a question and answer at the end. So you can um, either raise your hand or ask questions in the, using the chat function. Um, so bonjour, I'm Erin. I'm the event marketing and membership manager at the Alliance Francaise. Most of you know me. I'm so thrilled to welcome internationally best-selling author Mireille Giuliano, who is a longtime spokesperson for Champagne Veuve Clicquot and former president and CEO of Clicquot Incorporated. She visited us in Milwaukee, I think in 2010 and is the author of French Women Don't Get Fat, The Secret of Eating for Pleasure, and the French Women Don't Get Fat Cookbook, in which she recommends bread, champagne, chocolate, and romance as key ingredients to a balanced diet and lifestyle. She followed it up with another bestseller, French Women for All Seasons, A Year of Secrets, Recipes, and Pleasure, and then French Women Don't Get Facelifts, The Secret of Aging with Style and Attitude, and Meet Paris Oyster, A Love Affair with the Perfect Food, a memorable look at the French appetite for oysters, the characters who harvest them and serve them, and the compelling reasons why we should all enjoy them. She shares lessons <clears throat> learned along the business road, excuse me, <clears throat> in women, work, and the art of savoir faire, business sense and sensibility. Drawing from her experiences in the highest echelons of the business world and through lively stories, <clears throat> and helpful hints she gives women and a few men peut the practical advice they need to make the most of work without skimping and all the other good things in life. A native of France, she grew up amidst cooks, chefs, and restaurateurs and was educated in Paris, where she studied French and English literature. Mireille holds the French equivalent of a master's degree in English and German and a certification as a translator and interpreter. 
She also has a command of Italian and several other languages. She first arrived in America as an exchange student in Boston and came back for her professional career. She currently writes and now paints and resides in Provence with her husband, husband Edouard. And I could go on and on. I adore her recipes. Um, we're so happy she's here. Um, and her take on life as the pursuit of pleasure and balance is very inspiring. So merci Mireille. I'll hand it over to you. Merci, Erin, and uh, bonjour. Here it's bonsoir, but in Wisconsin is bonjour to all of you. And thank you for being there and joining us today. So uh, before I read you a little passage, let me just uh, put it into context. Um, as Erin mentioned, I wrote a couple of books, actually six, and when I finished Meet Paris Oyster, I thought I had said everything I had to say and would, would move on and do something else. Um, and um, for a couple of years, I, I didn't write that much, uh, but maybe coming here for um, COVID confinement uh, inspired me. And after all, I've spent years and years of my life starting when I was a a young girl going to Provence to visit relatives and then to visit, stay with families and eventually to, to own a little house where uh, I can spend, used to spend my little vacation I had when working in the US. And now that I'm semi-retired, I spend more and more time. And so this uh, spring, uh, I started writing and I had been scribbling last summer as well. And um, I worked on a tentative uh, title and it would be A French Woman in Provence. So uh, what I intend to do now is give you a little um, passage of uh, a chapter uh, to tell you how uh, we dealt with March and the events and how the summer progressed. So here we go. It's uh, part of chapter four, Birds and Bees, Youth Grant and the Street where I live. Back in early 2020, my husband Edwards and my plans for the next few months were simple. Go to Paris in March for a week or so, perhaps take a little side trip before checking on our home in Provence for the annual spring preparation for summer. All done, we would return to New York for most of April and May through the Memorial Day. Beautiful time to be in New York. Early March, we headed to Paris on schedule except the news of a virus in China and now Italy was giving us pause. Forget any side trip for the moment, but the president of the United States and the president of France were assuring us the situation was under control. My mother had taught me to ask at times of decision, what's the worst thing that can happen? At the time it was, if the virus came to France in force and was a risk for us, we'd have the French health system to count on, or we just would get on a plane and go back to New York. After all, the healthcare system in France is quite good, and the physician and hospitals in Manhattan are tops. What better places to be? You know what came next. Within a week of our arrival in Paris, the virus hit the proverbial fan. We'd been misled, things were not under control. France was unprepared, as was the US, for the rapid illnesses and the death threat that the virus was now presenting us. The French president said as much in a televised address on March 16 at 8 p.m. The Marseillaise boomed from our TV, an image of the French flag fluttered and a glimpse of the Elysee Palace shown then the somber face of the President de la République appeared. He was seated at a desk in a large open room. Mes chers compatriotes, he began, we are at war, blah, 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 and tomorrow we are going to lock down the country. 
The restaurant, movie theaters, live performance places, museums, all will be closed indefinitely. Stay inside as much as possible, keep a social distance. The message we, we heard was, get out now while the getting is good or be prepared to isolate yourself under strict rules. It turned, it turned out, of course, that Paris uh, or New York were not the best places to be. Contrary-wise, they were among the worst places to be. What to do? On our half-hour permitted exercise walk one day, we sat in the afternoon sun for a few minutes on a park bench in Place Saint-Sulpice and talked about all of this. No one was within 20 yards of us except eventually two policemen who came up to us and said, you cannot sit here. If we see you here again, we will ask your pass and give you a fine. What to do? New York, Paris, Paris, New York. We were in a number of ways conflicted. Eventually, the prospect of being in a Manhattan apartment during this period seemed like the least safe place to be. When a day later, great chains and locks closed the Luxembourg Gardens up the street from us, how dumb was that? And after a day of lockdown as prisoners of war in Paris, we knew Paris was not our best option either. We are fortunate in many ways, including having a place in Provence. At least we'd have the sun, a house to run around, bicycling, gardening, and not much need or opportunity to be near a lot of people, but, am uh, but amid lots of nature. Plus the irises and almond trees would be in bloom. In a drama out of a World War II movie or life involving two cancer trains and a signed letter of transit form to travel, we were able to flee Paris. You see, you needed travel passes with a specific purpose that the police would check and you'd be fine or perhaps march off the train if you didn't have the appropriate one, just like the war movies. And we weren't sure we'd qualify to cross the borders from one department or county to another. Cars were being stopped by police on the highway to the south, turning back drivers who gave the wrong reasons. Then the train we booked was, of course, canceled. They were cutting the trains back drastically to keep people from moving around. Forget any reliable information. The online information was barely updated and much not updated. And no one, no one was in an office answering phones. So we booked another train two days later. It too was canceled. We thought we'd better get out while we could and book the next available train. We went to the train station by a taxi as far as it could be imagined on empty streets, but we were not confident we would get on the train. Our reason for leaving was not quite what the government had in mind. Well, the turnstile gates were unattended. People just walked through wearing masks as we were and then boarded the train. We never had our tickets checked on our specially printed travel pass looked at. It seems anyone could have just got on any train. The train was by design only half filled. So two hours and 47 minutes later, when we decamped at the Avignon TGV station, I was confident we were not exposed to the virus. Our taxi driver was a young man who was clearly frightened to be near us or to touch anything, including our suitcases. He had created a makeshift plastic barrier between the front and back seat of his taxi. Nothing new to us as it is standard in New York, but in Provence, it was alien, and we were aliens coming from infested Paris. He wore a mask and gloves and confessed he needed the money and feared for his two young children. Welcome to Provence, spring 2020. It appeared we were going to be in Provence for an indefinite time. Well, we still are here today. The term is the U.S. State Department's advice then to Americans abroad. Come home immediately or settle down if you're in a safe place for an indefinite period. All was well, all was upside down. 
we were and are happy to have reached Provence, admittedly even feeling guilty at times about having such a place to be sheltering at home. So ideally and removed from time and reality. One amusing unreality occurred one, on our first morning, March 21st, in our little village of Egalière, when we needed to stop for a few days of food. We had to line up outside a small grocery store, six feet from other customers, and then only two at a time were permitted inside the store. It was our only contact and bonjour of the day. The only other couple in line in front of us was our neighbor, Hugh Grant, and his wife. His presence reassured us we had picked a relatively safe place for now. The next day, New York lockdown and of course became the worst epicenter of all. The most striking first realization of being in a historic Provence village in the Alpi Lina Alps down the road from Saint Remy de Provence, that road being the one the Romans built 2000 years ago and was used by the legions who travel to travel from a village encampment to another in what would become Saint Remy, was the coexistence of silence and birds. Absolute silence, it seemed, but with a steady symphony of bird songs from sunrise to sunset. The bird song was so prominent each morning, it was like the sweetest sounding alarm clock. We began taking notice like never before of the birds that visited us. There's a pair of black and white magpies we see often and have for years. I was happy to learn we are living on their property. They are very smart birds, I also learned, and I made it for life. Who knew they were married? So now seeing them is like seeing friends. We don't quite feel the same though about the snails that each night patrol our walkways and driveway. And we'll also have a special appetite for some of our flowers and especially my little basil plants. The most prominent bird song we hear is a distinctive one that awakens us each day, a melodic and repetitive whistling and trilling across some harmonic scale. I hear it now as I write this emanating from a tree, perhaps a hundred yards outside the window I'm facing. Our curiosity had been stimulated to so many things we have in our prior, prior haste been inattentive to. What birds make that sound? Amazing what you can find on the internet. A willow warbler? We think a few of these migratory spring song birds are living in bushes on our property. At least they respond to the call we play on our computer in the same voice. Quite amusing. Small towns are small towns. Everyone recognizes or knows everyone. Six degrees of separation are reduced to perhaps two. Half of the families in our village have been there forever. Gossip and rumor are currency of the day. Our village has about 400 residents at the time of the French Revolution and now about 1,800 spread out today, but probably a good number of these residents live in maisons secondaires or country houses, as we do. People descend on long weekends, holiday in the summer from Paris and Belgium, from England and America and elsewhere. So during confinement, we imagine there are perhaps 1,200 people around using the shops on the perhaps 300 yard main street, which is situated a few hundred yards down the slope from the old village of Egaliere, the top of hillside with stone ramparts, a medieval church, ruins of a small castle, and plenty of old village houses. Our home is much further down the tier slope from the village center, about half to three quarters of a mile, easy walking distance, except in the midday summer heat, and com comfortably removed from the village proper and in the so-called countryside. 
Calmed by the change from Paris, we settled into a routine quickly, which we maintained throughout the first phase of confinement that lasted through May 11. We kept our trip to the food stores to twice a week, each for about half an hour. We got out walking deep in nature for exercise, bicycle near our home a bit, strictly verboten, but, but fines were again, were threatened, but if you went anywhere, you shouldn't, which mostly meant more than a mile from our home. I doubt if anyone actually got a fine near us, but the rustic farmer living about a thousand yards from our home shouted and gesticulated widely to us when we rode a bike past his home. Interdit, interdit. Stop riding by my house or I will call the police. We stopped riding by. After all the years here, the merchant know us by name and probably much more than we realize. And on our second visit to shop for food, the owner of a local restaurant, Alain, was happy to see us. No cases here, no cases, he said. Just the doctor, but he's okay. People were practicing social distancing, but no one was wearing masks. There were none to be had. Fortunate us, we had a few, Alain then added. But in Oreille, a nearby village high up at the peak of the Alpes, there are 66 cases. A Chinese lady came back from China after the Chinese New Year to her companion, and they think she infected the village, but not here. That was scary to learn. A village six or seven miles away was infested with the virus. We were relieved a few days later. It was completely untrue. No cases in Oregon. Rumor, gossip, racist remark. I am shocked. Racism in France, as Captain Renault from the film Casablanca might say. Our village is a privileged place, and within a hundred yards on the short main street is a bakery, a small grocery store, butcher, pharmacy, cheese store, of course, and newspaper bookstore. All the essentials. There is even a public library, alas, closed during the confinement. There are restaurants and cafe as well but they are close to, of course. The main street is a one-way street, one lane with a lane for parking. When we arrived the second time on our supply run and I got out of the car and was standing in the middle of the street, I saw walking around me without a mask, I wear one, again, you Gran and his wife. And he says, bonjour, and I said, bonjour. That was again the only bonjour of the day, save for the obligatory hello from the shopkeepers. The grands loaded up at the pastry shop with bread and goodies, presumably for their little kids. Actually, twice a week at 9.15 a.m., Hugh Grant says bonjour to me. Once when he and I were at the cheese store and he was with his very young daughters, he told them to say bonjour to the man who sizes the cheese. I've seen him once with his son, who is about eight, playing with a soccer ball. His house is six or seven away from ours, just at the base of the village and behind a big wall. I walk by it often, and one day I heard him playing with his kids. He played the role of different animals, talking to them. I still see you, Gran and his wife, going to the same bakery, same day and time I do. He still is not wearing a mask. They buy pastry and coffee and eat on a bench socially separated from anyone by about 30 feet. He likes pain au chocolat, but enough about you, Gran, and gossip. Merci. Merci. <laughs> um. Uh, it, you're still welcome to drop any questions in the chat or save them till the end, but um, we were going to have Mireille talk about uh, some of her um, paintings that you've created recently. Is that right? Are they, have you just started painting or did you paint in years past? 
Well, actually, um, for 40 years, I've been going to museum. I love art. Um, I go to all kinds of art from photo, black and white, to uh, modern pictures, to uh, old ones and uh, watercolor or oils. And a few years ago, I started um, living in a village. Egaliere, our little village, is very famous for, for painters. They've come from all over and there's quite a community of, of native and foreign painters. And so um, I, started, I started actually with a little boy who um, I took care of one summer because his mother was working. She's my good friend in the village and he liked drawing. And I said, well, actually, you know, drawing is not my strength but there are students on the internet who could come and give you classes. So um, someone came and uh, had just graduated from a famous um, art school. And uh, while they were working, I was dabbling with a few watercolors and things. And she said, oh, I didn't know you were a painter. And I thought she was joking, you know. <laughs> I said, well, I'm just, you know, this is like a hobby. She said, really, this is, this is quite something. And I thought, well, maybe she's trying to be nice. But um, I, I do, um, as you will see, some watercolor, but mostly uh, abstract and um, gouache and acrylic on canvas and on, on special paper. Okay. So I think you have selected a few and uh, we can go through them and I'll make a few comments as we go along. All right. This actually is the first of a trilogy uh, about the COVID and they're actually very sad. As you see, this one is Egaliere, my village and a very abstract shape of a little house, which is a 1760 house with the cypresses. Uh, but each one was uh, with a dash of color to, to express my hope for this disease to go over, get over with soon. So this is Egaliere with a dash of hope. And in the case of Egaliere, the color has to be uh, yellow or orange, which is the spring sun colors. And the next one, of course, was the place where I, I spend also a lot of time in my life, which is Paris. And of course I had to draw the, sort of draw the Eiffel Tower. And the dash of hope here is the blue, which I picked because blue is, well, not only the color of the sky, but also the color of uh, romance. And France for many people is uh, the place for uh, romance and is often cited as a romantic country. And the last one, of course, is the city where I spend a great deal of my life and which I like very much called New York City. So you can see these gray skyscrapers and, and, and friends were sending me um, pictures of the city under COVID. This was in March, April. Uh, but the dash of hope here was the, the lady with the red umbrella because red is the color of energy and to me, uh, New York was, at least for uh, decades, the city of uh, great energy. Uh, although I did put a little black on her coat uh, to show that all was not so rosy yet. And uh, we hope that things will get better. And this is a, a, some vignette about my village. Um, uh, and Provence in general, of course, but um, this, the first one is of Egaliere with, uh, with a vision of the sea because we're not, we are an hour from the sea, but we really don't see it from, from there, but I love the beach and the Mediterranean uh, Sea. So uh, that was my expressive uh, way of doing it. The, the one on the right is uh, a kind of, um, you know, Van Gogh inspired little drawing because Van Gogh, as you know, lived in Saint-Rémy, which is nearby down the, uh, a few kilometers and uh, also painted about Egaliere. So 
Um, that was a way of showing what is in Provence. You see some uh, vineyards and olive groves, of course, all pretty abstract. And, um, and a pink sky, which is uh, the color they are right now in September. They're called northern skies and they are quite beautiful and very hard to paint. On the second row on the left, you see uh, a typical lavender field uh, and the greenery in the background and the, the always wonderful blue sky. And in the foreground, um, a cornfield that has just been harvested. And the one on the right is a typical little mass. Mass means, means farmhouse in Provence. And um, you usually have a main building, a little, a little barn, a little courtyard with a summer kitchen. And people eat outside for breakfast, lunch, and dinner about six months a year. And of course, you see the olive tree on the right. It's everywhere. And on the bottom one on the left is again a very kind of a Van Gogh uh, inspired with the, um, the stones in the ground, the galley, and uh, the, uh, the uh, trees of, and the back of the Alpi. The Alpi means little Alps, and it's actually what I see from our, our window, and the village is surrounded by the end of the Alps. And uh, it's, uh, it's what Van Gogh painted best. It's mostly limestone and it's gray, but in colors, and you will see a shot later, um, there is, because of the strong light and the blue sky, always some kind of reflection of a bluish tone to it. So many painters actually paint the Alps here uh, in a bluish colors. And the last picture on the right is, is my favorite little chapel a uh, Roman chapel on the other side of uh, my village called La Chapelle Saint-Sixt, uh, surrounded by cypresses and a dead almond tree that no one wants to cut. And every spring, but not this one, um, women from Arles come in their uh, local costumes and uh, do a little uh, festive weekend. Uh, on the hill of the chapelle. And it's quite a pilgrimage for a lot of people. And it was actually uh, a stop for people who would go and walk to the Saint Jean de Compostelle in the Basque area uh, pilgrimage. Uh, this was my first um, series of uh, puppies this spring. This one is actually um, a watercolor with a little gouache um, of um, some puppies I had cut off on my walk and were on my home table. And these ones were made with um, a technique I like and I use more and more with a knife painting to sort of um, express more of an, an abstract, but the background is watercolor. And this one is actually um, my favorite because um, in the past, I would never have thought about doing a watercolor of daisies, but this time, because we have more time and we pay more attention, I looked at them and the way they uh, sort of, um, fade is quite beautiful. They take all kinds of uh, pinky shades. And uh, here it was a bunch that I had cut and that uh, come out from a bunch I had in my dining room. These were the roses. Uh, it's again a watercolor from the roses we have all over the property. And they're mostly light pink. And the beautiful thing about roses is that they, they come back three, four times during the season. So we all have, always have roses around, including right now, which is October. And this was my first kind of a ray of hope uh, in the springtime. It's called uh, Soleil Provençal, Provençal Sun which is of course the color it looks like. Um, 
when uh, you go out uh, very, very early in the morning and see these wonderful colors. I think that's one of the rare drawing I do because I am drawing, as I said, is not my, uh, my forte, but for my husband's birthday, he likes birds. So I try to do a little hummingbird because we have lots of them around. And um, these are the famous laurel flowers that we have all over in our garden and that, that uh, are all over roads and, and, and paths in Provence. This is a little bit further down, but if you know how, uh, if you have a map of, of the south of France in front of you, you might uh, recall that there is an area called La Camargue, which is unlike any area of France. This is when, where rice is made, where white horses go in freedom, and it's near the sea. And we often go there for beach days. And this was around a little, um, a little uh, bed and breakfast where we stayed, and it's a watercolor showing the pond where all the birds would come at night. This is a colorful, again, um, hope, <laughs> a, a colorful abstract picture of a typical Provencal church with the bells and, and uh, sort of an Avignon uh, background. Uh, and this was uh, a nostalgic one because end of the summer where when the blue colors, all the blue colors kind of fade away, I, um, I, I miss them. Uh, lavender is over, the pure blue sky is over. So one day I decided to, um, to do a clock, a Provence clock of course should be on noon because time stops, but mine is working <laughs> and it's 10 o'clock when I did it. And it has typical shades of blues from the lavender one and the sky and the sea and the lights coming in. And I called it L'Heure Bleu, the blue hour or the blue time. This is what I talked about, the Alpi. This is what I see from my window. So you see the shade of blue I picked uh, that comes from the light and sky. And then of course, the, in the foreground, it's a typical uh, landscape you have when you're in the countryside. There are fields of uh, lavender, uh, olive groves, vineyards, and uh, of course the yellow is for sunflowers. After the puppies come the sunflower season. And this is uh, actually also something I see from my uh, eastern window. It's a view on, on a mountain that some of you, if you are a cyclist and you follow the Tour de France every July, might recognize. It's called Le Mont Ventoux. And it's about an hour and a half, two hours uh, from here by car. Uh, but um, in the spring, it still has a little bit of snow. And it's quite a beautiful mountain. It, it's 25 kilometer long and about 2,000. Uh, feet high, so it's not that high. In the background, you have the Alps on a beautiful day. But when you are on top, and we, we do it, of course, by car, because <laughs> when you do it by car, you realize how difficult it is to bike up there. But the scenery is quite beautiful. It's very different from the Alpi. It's in the Luberon, and the Luberon has a lot of greens, uh, a lot of um, forests, which you see on, in the foreground. And, and then um, a lot of um, small hills where the, uh, the lambs and the, um, the goats go and, and eat. And um, the top there is um, quite a sight because on a beautiful day, you can see miles and miles away. You can see the Mediterranean, you can see the Alps, you can see cities like uh, Marseille and lots of villages around and lots of, of sites. It's quite uh, worth a tour, a detour if you visit Provence. And then the last one is of course, um, one of the most 
seen sites in France after uh, Notre Dame and the Eiffel Tower in Paris. It's the third most visited site. It's called Les Bouts de Provence. And it's this amazing perch village where um, today very few people live, but that you can visit. And uh, there's an old castle and there is at the end, um, a sort of flat area where you can walk and again, see the Mediterranean on a clear day. And I, I painted that from down in the village looking up. Uh, it's uh, surrounded by uh, rocks and, and um, that, that where you have holes where hermits, hermits live and hermits. <laughs> And it's uh, quite, a, quite a sight to see and very, very impressive. And that too, if you visit Provence, it's kind of a, a must see. So thank you. <clears throat> Great. Let me just stop the share. There we go, we're back. <laughs> um, so do you paint en plein air a lot or do you, do you paint in your studio? No, always inside. I, I looked and I, I have lots of, ideas that, you know, from, as I said, from museums, but also from magazine photos or advertisement. Uh, sometimes I do very weird things. I'm, I'm working la, on, on a flag series of France and, and or on a French map series and that I saw in some kind of TV ads like some years ago and things come back and then I go from there. So I don't have any specific you know, topic or, um, or um, thing I like to do, but I, I would say generally speaking, abstract is more my inclination. Um, well, switching gears a little bit, did you wanna talk about some healthy habits and recommendations during COVID time? I see we have a few questions from, one from Susan, what are a couple of main reasons why French women don't get fat and um, <laughs> from both Susans, how do French women stay thin in a nutshell? So I know everyone's concerned about that, especially during the- Yeah, the yeah. actually, uh, you know, French women with globalization and, and work, women working more and more have fallen into traps that many other countries have fallen into before. And actually, right now, especially after COVID and the confinement, uh, the government issued a, a warning that you know half of France is 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 overweight. So uh, that's that's a pretty bad statistic. And um, I would say that uh, what I said in French women don't get fat is is. Um, is a French lifestyle that still a lot of people and lot, certainly my friends and their kids uh, are raised that way, but that is more and more lost by the young generation, especially. And it's trying to uh, take care of your body and he eat healthy and cook a little bit, which less and less people do. Um, and of course, eating locally and fresh food as much as possible. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if, if uh, every one of us is different. So if you don't eat like breakfast, you still need to uh, give your body energy and give your body the right vitamins and the right minerals and the right food. But it's, it's up to each of us to develop what they need to eat. Generally speaking, I would say, because we are all more or less very sedentary people nowadays, uh, we tend to eat, and that's proven in all the, the, the research, we all tend to eat 10 to 30% more than what we need. We don't need that much to survive or to feel well. So we have to think, and when we eat, see is we really need to, to eat that big plate of food or uh, a whole pizza or you know this huge amount of pasta or this big steak of half a pound or whatever and uh, i talked in my book about the 50 percent solution you know it's like you look at your food and first of all you have to learn to sort of take time and certainly with covid people had had more time to 
sit down and not rush. So that's not a good excuse to gain weight. But what people didn't do is uh, they ate, they baked a lot, they ate a lot of um, carbs, and they didn't have balanced balance meals. So you have to try to look at balanced meal. Every meal should have protein, carbs, and fat. And you know, there's no food that's bad for you. When people say bread is bad for you, no, well, white bread is bad for you. Anything with white flour is bad for you. But today, in the US or in France, everywhere, there are plenty of great bread made with uh, buckwheat um, flour or chickpea flour or whatever that are good for you. So a piece of bread is perfectly fine, but don't eat half of the bread uh, loaf. You know? mm-hmm. So it's all in quantity. It's also in uh, prepare, preparing your food. will teach you what you put into your body because when you buy food, it's obviously over salted or over sweet and more salt and more sugar make you more hungry. So the food industry is in a way sort of poisoning you, telling you eat more, eat more, eat more. And you know that to eat fast is, is very bad because you eat like a robot so you can eat endlessly. But if you sit down and take the time and try to relax and eat slowly and chew and you know, put your fork down between each, each bite, you will see that you will start eating less, smaller portions, because it takes 20 minutes for your stomach to give your brain the signal that you've had an enough. And most of us don't eat in 20 minutes, and that's a pity. And for me, uh, having my mainly meal at lunch and spending, you know, an hour and a half at the table is great. And actually both my husband and I have lost over five pounds just just by doing the right thing and not thinking about it. But we're never hungry and we don't deprive ourselves of anything. We have a little piece of chocolate, we have a glass of wine, we have, but everything in moderation, you know. So you have to think quantity over quality. You have to think simplicity. Uh, And of course, you know, now with the fall coming, uh, making soup is very inexpensive and easy, and you can make a big pot for you know a week. And most French people who eat healthily will have just a little bowl of soup or salad or you know a yogurt and a piece of fruit for dinner. Uh, it's important not to have a big dinner and not to go to bed within two three hours after a meal. And then, of course, don't forget to drink a lot of water during the day, no matter what people say. Water is very important. Two thirds of our body is water. We need water to flush our toxins. And um, if you if you do that, you don't really need to fast or to be on a diet. You know, actually, you don't need to fast because we have. If you have balanced meals, you uh, you have wonderful organs who do the work for you. But once in a while, it's, it's, as I said, in French women don't get fat, it's nice to do a league weekend, you know, because it flushes out all the toxins and cleans out your body and sort of puts you back to, hey, pay attention, you know, because at the end of the day, the weight we gain, it's all in our head. You know, if we say we're hungry, have a glass of water, go for a walk, wait 10 minutes. Most of the time, you're not hungry. You've had dinner. Do you need to eat uh, watching TV? Do you need your Fritos or your whatever while um, you know watching a movie? Uh, I don't think so. And so, pick your moments, you know. And if you eat, there's nothing wrong having your indulgence, whatever it is, if it's a hamburger or Fritos or for me a chocolate or ice cream. But pick, pick it, you know, choose it and savor it and eat slowly. And, and of course, uh, last but not least, uh, try to move, you know, uh, walk or do any kind of exercise. And that, again, you don't need to go out. Of course, it's better if you can go out in nature, but you can do a lot in a room and you can pretend uh, to walk stairs and you can pretend to do the rope, even without a rope, I I do my exercise and I pretend the rope is there, but I have no rope. 
So uh, you can trick your body, your mind, and that would help you because winter is coming soon. And as we all know, most people tend to uh, gain weight during the winter. So try to do a month or two of, uh, of balance and harmony and your body will thank you for that. Well, I, um, I'll read some of these from the chat. It looks like we have a lot of questions. Patrice um, says, I would like to ask about blue being the color of romance in your paintings. Um, is that from French literature? Yes. Okay. And Patrice, if you, I can unmute you if you had, was that your main? Okay, oops. Um, let's see. Um, Kent Brody wants to know, do you write first in French and then translate to English or vice versa? <laughs> I never write in French. I've always written in English. Uh, I always find it easier. I, I you know after my master in English, uh, I went to America and spoke English uh, most of my life all day. So um, I always write in English and think in English. But of course, now after being in France for eight months, I dream in French and I, I speak French uh, at least half of the time. And I read a lot of French books. That's, that's of course, uh, the literature is uh, very vital for me and um, I read a lot of books. Okay, Barbara Collignon said, I love your paintings um, and especially the Eiffel Tower and Hummingbird. They're whimsical and interesting. She just says, merci. Um, Jane wants to know who, your, who are your favorite painters? Um, mm. First Many, one. but I would say Matisse, uh, Matisse, uh, Nicolas de Stal, um, and um, I would say many of the Impressionists. Uh, but I have painter I like in every period almost. So, um, you know, it's more uh, the type of uh, what what paintings from them I like. <laughs> okay. And I think uh, Patrice, did you wanna Patrice has follow-up questions? <laughs> Bonjour Mireille. Bonjour. <laughs> De Milwaukee à, à Provence. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm the one that asked about your reference to the color blue and yes. Eric Aaron asked you where that came from, and you said it came from literature, but I need to know more. I have never heard that before. I've studied a lot of French literature. I always thought red was the color of passion, so I need to know why blue is the color of romance. Yes, actually, um, I mean, you can make what you want from, from colors, but obviously red is passion and energy and many things. It depends what culture, if you look at, uh, you know, from the Greeks to the Romans to, to different countries, uh, everybody has a different idea of rating what color, what color means. For example, um, orange in India has a different meaning than orange in France. Uh, but blue for the French is, um, you know, it's the sun, it's the sea, it's, it's everything that sort of uh, calls to romance. That's why I would like to retire in Nice because I want to be near the blue, near the sky, yes. near the sea, and near romance as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great place. <laughs> Merci. You're welcome. Um, Robin wants to ask how the mediums for your paintings are chosen for each one. Oh, that's totally. Uh... Totally, how I feel that day, <laughs> uh, and and I, I lately I do mostly uh, oil, you know, gouache and oil painting and um, acrylic, because I do a lot of abstracts. But um, uh, what I put as in terms of colors, uh, let's say if I make a bunch of flowers or a landscape, is entirely. Um, 
changeable from one week to another. I've done several versions of, <laughs> of the same site and the colors can be quite different. Depend on my mood, I guess. Um, and I was just wondering how you, how did you decide to um, find a house in Provence? Have you traveled around France a lot? Were there other areas that you liked well, or something special? Yeah. No, I mean, there are so many, you know, every country has a lot of beautiful places, but I spent a lot of time in Provence when I grew up and then um, we, we didn't come for a while. And uh, when I got married, my, my husband loved Alsace, nearby where I grew up and where my grandmother was. And then he discovered Provence with me along and uh, sort of we fall in love again. And then... Um, we came back regularly and for years we looked for a place and, and uh, we couldn't find what we had in mind. And we stayed with uh, relatives and friends and, uh, and then about uh, 20 years ago, we found this little uh, house, which is one maybe of eight, nine left in the village that is uh, an old, um, uh, bergerie for for um, for um, shepherds, and it's uh, from the 1760 or so, and uh, and it was exactly what we needed. We we didn't want. I mean, there are amazingly huge properties in in this area, uh, you know, like two New York City blocks with a lot of uh, gardens and vineyards and and olive grove around and. But we, we like this little one and we like being able to be near the village, but not in the center of the village. So it's, you know, less than 10 minute walk. And it was just uh, a, a coup de coeur, as we say in French, um, you know, who fell, fell in love with it the minute we saw it. So we've been very happy here and had a lot of relatives and friends from all over the world come and visit and we show them Provence. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, I think I read everything from the chat, but if you have questions or comments, Jane, I see you wrote something. Did you want to, oops, no, okay. <laughs> she said, um, there's an abstract Nicola de Stal painting of a large boat, which atmospherically connects with your beautiful rendering of Lebo. That's cute. Um, uh, last, last call for any questions. Oh, okay. No, don't be shy. Okay, Crystal, there you go. <laughs> Alors, je dirais merci pour les, les conseils, Mireille. Je vous en prie. Oh, qui okay, est ce beau bébé? Ah oui. On dort. On dort? Oui. C'est une fille ou un garçon? Une fille. Une fille. Oui. <laughs> Merci encore. Je vous en prie. Merci. Um, Peter was wondering if you were in New York City during 9-11. Yes, I was. And actually I saw I saw I saw the site from my window. Yeah. It's um, it was not a good a good year. And actually uh, right now I just got interviewed because there's a French producer who is doing a film about uh, interviewing French people who lived there at the time and their experience of it. And um, when I told her my stories, she said, would you accept to be in this documentary? Because um, this is what exactly what we need to, to, to learn and, and want, want to uh, uh, make sure that no one forgets what, what happened that very day and how it affected so many lives. Great. Um, well, merci beaucoup for joining us. All You're the welcome. Way from Provence. So we hope that you can visit Milwaukee again someday. Someday maybe, who knows? <laughs> but right now, uh, tomorrow night we will know more, but um, 
the president of France is supposed to announce what what if the rules in Paris are going to change or if it got worse or better. And uh, so we might uh, end the year here and spend our first winter ever, uh, fall winter ever in Provence. So, so be it. So enjoy the fall in Wisconsin and enjoy those beautiful uh, Indian, Indian colors. Okay, merci beaucoup. Bye bye. Thank you so much to all of you. Bonsoir. Okay. Et bon weekend. Bon, bonne semaine plutôt. The weekend is over. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.